higher education is often a checkpoint before true adulthood as college students must juggle numerous responsibilities, including completing work before deadlines, comprehending learned information, earning satisfactory grades, obtaining internships, jobs, research opportunities, learning to network, finding the finances to attend college and university. So the stress inflicted upon students is endless. And with the pandemic providing additional stressors, the mental health of college students today must be addressed. So let's jump right into um, our introductions of the panelists. James, if you'd please go first. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is James Garrett. I am a, uh, in three weeks, I'll be a graduate of Clark Atlanta University. I'm getting my master's in social work. I'm also, <laughs> I'm also an intern at Healing Consultants LLC, as I'm in training uh, to be a licensed master social worker. And I'm uh, basically a therapist. Um, and I am being trained on coping skills uh, to combat stress, anxiety, depression, and you know life transitioning skills. And my framework is is primarily in, is is solution based. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, James. All right, Charlie, go ahead. Hey y'all, my name is Charlie Wood. Pronounce him. I'm a third year undergraduate chem major and psych minor at Georgia Tech. And I'm a pretty big mental health advocate. I'm the chair for the Mental Health Joint Allocations Committee, which oversees $600,000 in spending for mental health initiatives. I was the former chair of the Mental Health Network, which is an advocacy group that interfaces with admin. I have stepped down as chair, uh, but I served for a year and great experience. Um, I'm also a Healthy Jacket Peer Educator for, and a QPR instructor, uh, and I'm interning with the Carter Center for their mental health program right now. Great to have you, Charlie. All right, and Atticus? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Atticus. I'm a my fourth year environmental engineering major at Georgia Tech. Um, I am, as this is really related to mental health, I'm an RA and mentor for first year experiences. Um, I am trained a lot on mental health uh, tips and programs I'm in universities with the top five. Hi, Atticus. It was really hard to hear you. Your audio is kind of in and out. Do you want to try that one more time? <laughs> yes, let me know if it continues to finish. I can try disconnecting or disconnecting. Is it better or? No. Nope. That's all right. I mean, this is just yet a, another example of how COVID-19 has impacted our lives. I mean, we're having to do this conference via Zoom and there are so many technical difficulties that can happen. It's just insane how used to it we can get. <laughs> I'm gonna try again. Is this any better? Yes, perfect. Okay, awesome. sorry. Awesome. Um, as I was saying, my name is Atticus Lemihu. I am a fourth year um, environmental engineering student at Georgia Tech. Um, I am graduating in May 2022, so I have a few a few more semesters to go, um, but I'm also an RA in the first year dorms. I've been in this position for going on four years in August. Um, over those four years, I've had uh, lots of experiences with students who might be struggling with mental health, um, so kind of seeing it from a more school-based perspective, but myself personally, I've also dealt with um, mental health struggles in the past four or five years. So I'm very excited to be on this panel um, and looking forward to a good conversation. Thank you so much. All right, so let's dive right in. Um, we have a list of prepared questions, but for anyone who is watching, if you have any questions you'd like to ask the panelists or to discuss, please put it in the chat and Destiny will bring it to our attention. So the first question is, where were you when you found out about the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in March of 2020? And what were your initial thoughts and your reactions? Um, let's start with James. Well, uh, where was I? I was in North Carolina for spring break when I uh, first heard what uh, the impact of coronavirus was. Um, being in North Carolina, I had just left Georgia. I go to school in, in Atlanta. I just left Georgia maybe two or three days prior. 
and I got the call that, you know, there's going to be something that's coming. We don't know what it is, but you all have to move out. Um, I was an RA at the time and, you know, being in that position of leadership, uh, I think it kind of, I had to put on not just a real mask, but, you know, I had to put on a mask so I could, you know, help prepare and help all of the students in the building get out safely, um, help their, them and their parents move a lot of their uh, belongings. Some students, you know, were battling with, with homelessness because they didn't know where they were going at, because they were, you know, moved off of campus abruptly. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was in North Carolina when I first heard about coronavirus. Charlie, do you have anything you want to add to that or do you want to Go ahead and speak to your portion of the question. Uh, sure, I'd love to. Uh, I was actually in a committee meeting for the Health and Wellbeing Committee for Student Government. Um, and I felt like I had been fired. Uh, I was supposed to be TAing a study abroad program and I was supposed to be um, implementing this mindfulness course, and then we would be getting data from the study abroad about whether or not we should include mindfulness in that classwork. Um, and to see that project kind of just crumble was a little disheartening. Um, and that wasn't the only one, but that was definitely one of the ones that stuck out. And so for uh, a good month, I felt like I was floundering before I could put my wheels to the ground again and move forward. And Atticus? Um, so I actually was sitting in my bed. It was probably around 1130 when I got the first news that somebody in Fulton County had um, been infected. And that was about mid-February. And I remember sitting there at the time like, OK, so it's actually a pretty big issue now. Um, it's in our it's in my home city. So um, like uh, like James was saying about being an RA, um, kind of figuring out what do I need to be doing from a professional standpoint, but also from a personal standpoint. Um, the few weeks that followed as everybody started moving back home or moving back um, away from the dorms were really rough. Um, it was a huge transition, a huge shift for everybody. Um, so kind of navigating how do I deal with how I'm feeling about this on a personal level and how do I deal with this on a more professional level for my students and for my coworkers on my team. So it was definitely rough, um, but yeah, it, I, I will remember that sitting in my bed in February, getting that notification for a while. And then Atticus, like mentally, when, when everything was starting to happen, I mean, go back to fall 2019 and then just go through up until now. I mean, where, where is your head at and where was it at? What, what, how has it impacted you? I would say definitely as things started progressing and we went back home, I still had midterms that I had to take when I got back. Um, I still had final exams that I had to take. I was in group projects for some of my like 4,000 level classes. Um, and so it was a huge, huge transition. And I think a lot of it for me was just avoiding tendencies. Um, I didn't wanna think about it. I didn't wanna deal with it. Um, as far as I was concerned, the pandemic was gonna end. I thought it was going to end in May, you know, I thought it was going to be done by then I would be back in Atlanta for my internship by then. Um, so a big part of me was not really even wanting to think about it. Um, but as the months progressed and the summer months went on and it was very apparent an issue um, and it's going to be a lasting issue. Um, I think just kind of a sense of this is what we're dealing with now. This is what we have to go through. It's going to be a shift um, from every standpoint, whether you're a student, a professional, a teacher, a, you know, an RA or what, what have you. Um, everybody kind of has to shift. And it was, like I said, very difficult. It was a huge shift, um, especially coming back in August and having um, students who had missed their graduation, their high school graduation, who weren't able to go to their high school prom, moving into a dorm where they weren't even allowed to like socialize in the hallway. They could only talk to each other and their roommate pairs. Um, so it was very difficult for me as an RA to see that, um, but also experience it because I wasn't able to talk to my residents in the way that years past we had connected and really gotten to know each other. Yeah, that's that's really tough. I mean, James or Charlie, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, I definitely agree with everything you know Atticus just said. Um, again, the transition was, was very difficult um, at that time. 
Um, and I also thought that we would be able to be back within months. You know, I, I, I plan to have a storage unit for, you know, three months. I've had a storage unit for the last 16 months, you know? So, you know, just <laughs> making financial plans, you know, how that was stressful, making plans to go back home and, you know, as you're an adult now, you're back at home. I was back at home with, with my mother for temporarily. And, uh, you know, those growing pains of seeing, you know, how our relationship evolved, you know, because, you know, your son isn't 17 anymore and the conversations that we have are different, you know, having to feeling like I was, for me personally, I felt that, you know, I kind of thought this was the end of the world for a second. I didn't, we didn't know what to expect. And Charlie, I know you've done a lot of research in, in this area. Do you have anything you want to add from that aspect? I am so glad you asked. Um, it's been really interesting to see how crisis text lines and crisis hotlines have been impacted by everything going on because more people than ever were pushed to a point where they realized, hey, I need help. And to be honest, there is a silver lining in that because for a very long time, we have seen so many communities without equitable access to mental health care. And it still exists, those disparities still exist, especially because of a digital divide and access to Wi-Fi and all these other things. But that access was broadened and you started seeing a lot more people have access to telebehavioral health. And there are so many expansions that happened in insurance policies to be able to provide this and make sure that people were still being supported during this time. Um, and what we see with telebehavioral health options is that overall, the quality for most forms of mental health disorders are comparable to in-person sessions. For things like depression and anxiety, you can still work through those. And it actually makes it easier because you're reducing the barrier to actually going to that appointment, to, to scheduling that in. And more people that maybe weren't as open to therapy before. It was maybe more stigmatized. It was suddenly easier to access and you had more people reaching out for those services. Um, it definitely doesn't work for everyone. Uh, for trauma disorders, it's a little harder because there tend to be specialized techniques and you, it doesn't work uh, in a virtual platform. But there is a net silver lining, I think, where we didn't actually see an increase in attempts, um, to my knowledge, as of last August. Um, I'm not sure if the data has changed since then. I mean, it's been a long year and it definitely could change. Um, but throughout that summer, more people were being proactive about their care. And if we can keep that up and acknowledge that we need to get help before we're at a crisis point and we have better access to it because of telebehavioral health options, it opens up new doors and we can have a more sustainable world where we are creating a mental health infrastructure that is more equitable, has greater access, and we can keep it up because there were some great changes that happened and I wanna keep them. Man, I love that. James or Atticus, do you have anything to add to that or do you wanna talk about the work that you've been doing? Uh, I kind of saw two sides of this. Um, of course, us being college students, I think we, I'll have some form of privilege to a certain degree. Um, but as an intern, I was intern, I was an intern at uh, Warner Rise Financial Center where uh, we provide financial coaching for people in the west side of Atlanta. And, you know, during this, during the year before the pandemic started, you know, we probably, we had a good amount of clients, but there wasn't much consistency. But, you know, as the pandemic started to take its course, you know, there were a lot of people signing up because, you know, now we're in this financial bind. We weren't prepared to have, you know, two months worth of rent. Uh, people were maxing out their credit cards. People, you know, had to pull their children out of school. People were getting sick, people were dying. So, you know, having to, you know, pay for funerals, relocate, have all of the, get all of these resources together so fast uh, was definitely a very stressful moment. And, and for some still are, um, I have a few clients that are in, you know, a gateway who still have to, you know, are still trying to work back to getting um, stable housing. And, 
you know, I, I personally just, I, it, it put a lot of us at a disadvantage, but as Charlie mentioned, you know, access to, to uh, telebehavioral health has definitely um, improved a lot of those conditions and has opened minds of other people who were once opposed to seeking therapy. To that point, I just kind of like to mention that um, access to the mental health resources available is still very much an equity issue. Um, as people were signing up for consultation or you know initial meetings, um, I have lots of friends who were unable, unfortunately, to be able to sign up or find you know a regular counselor that they'd be able to see on a weekly or a monthly basis even. Um, I'm very lucky in being able to have somebody who I've been able to see every week for the last like two or three years now. Um, but for who hadn't sought out or weren't needing, uh, you know, specific levels of counseling, be it weekly or like I said, monthly, um, as more and more folks started signing up, it was very, very, very difficult for some of my friends to find somebody. And for some of my friends, they still haven't found somebody. Um, and again, that's, I think, very much an equity issue as we're kind of talking about um, as specific situations arise, some of their priorities might shift um, financially towards, like you mentioned, paying for a funeral, or if they need their kids to be able to go to a school, um, putting money into making sure that other people are taken care of before them personally are taken care of, whether it's through counseling or um, maybe if they're dealing with addiction or tendencies for addiction, um, kind of finding resources for that. So it's been very tough for everybody. I think even those who maybe didn't have um, terrible mental health um, practices beforehand, I think everybody's kind of gone through some shift in their, um, you know, uh, ability to take care of themselves, whether it be through professional counseling or even just talking to friends, which has been severely limited with everything being online. I couldn't agree more with the points that you guys have just made. And speaking to that, that equity issue, what have your organizations or your universities and colleges, what do you think they've been doing to help students out and to help reach those people that do need the help, but they can't necessarily access it? Um, I might speak a little on this. Uh, so I think Georgia Tech, and I'm sure Charlie can attest to this, Georgia Tech has done a very good job about reaching out to people and providing access um, or even suggesting off-campus resources for folks. Um, I'm on an exec position for an organization on our campus, and I know within our leadership, we've really pushed for our members to reach out if they need it, um, talk to each other if they need it, our exec um, communication lines are always open. Um, I can't speak for other organizations, but I know Georgia Tech has a very strong campus culture of making sure that others are doing okay. Um, and across all universities um, in the United States, it's very hard sometimes to get resources on campus to mental health um, you know, access. But I think as an institution as a whole, we're doing as, as good of a job, I think, as I can say, as we can to help people, whether it's formally or informally, like through organizational efforts. Yeah, go ahead, Charlie. Thank you. Georgia Tech has also, as chair of Jack, we explored with the Counseling Center getting better help options for our international and out-of-state students because telebehavioral health licensing laws are kind of restricted for each state where you have to be physically located in the state that you're getting the provider. Um, because otherwise it becomes a legal boogaloo um, and it gets very confusing about who has the actual authority there. Um, although the better help option was very expensive and we were not able to actually form a partnership with them, uh, we did create an international resources guide for international students and then they could get a one-time referral. Um, our counseling center and our triage center, GT Care, both transitioned to telebehavioral health options. So that way they could support students. And even if you weren't in state, you could still call our triage center and then get an off-campus referral for a provider near you. Um, and then something that the Mental Health Network has been advocating for all year and is finally getting some headway is was a module for a, a standard baseline of mental health literacy. And so we have these requirements in our university system of Georgia for 
alcohol education, and then sexual violence prevention education, but we don't have anything for mental health. Um, and so something that has come out of this year is that we are pursuing a contract with Everfi because they have a, a well-being course that was made by uh, the Jed Foundation, which is a nonprofit to improve higher education um, mental health services and also by Everfi in this partnership with them. Um, so I'm hoping that we can finalize that contract and have that provided for all our first year students and transfer students as well coming into our university. Um, at the broader university system of Georgia level, they got a lot of CARES Act funding and it was then redistributed into the Greer's Act and it just keeps trickling down. Um, but I think that was $11.5 million that was dedicated to improving the mental health services of all USG institutions. Uh, and the main big ticket item for that initiative was the Christie Krampus program, which is similar, honestly, to our GT care program where we triage students um, and then they are referred to the most appropriate resource because sometimes the resource you want is not the resource that you need. Um, and understanding that you might really want therapy, but there might be a more upstream um, resource for you and you can work through something before going to therapy or before getting uh, a psychiatrist. Um, but it, that's more of a tangent. But, and so this Christy Krampus resource is providing our triage um, level of care for all the institutions in the university system. And so that's an 18 month contract. They also have what amounts to kind of like a wellness blog slash education hub of where you can just peruse all of the uh, resources and tips and tricks for having good well-being hygiene, because there's a difference between mental illness and well-being hygiene, because it's the practices you take to have good mental health. But that's not strictly mental illness. There's a it's a difference because you can have good well-being practices, but you can still be mentally ill and vice versa. Um, and understanding that difference too, I think, has been especially important during the pandemic uh, and knowing how you can really take care of yourself and mitigate the stress that you're feeling. I think that's a great point um, because I do I've witnessed a lot of people kind of, you know self-identify themselves with certain uh, diagnoses and things like that. And, you know, in all actuality, it's just uh, situational. Um, and it's not to downplay whatever they are feeling. However, you know, it, uh, it takes, what, six months? So depending on the diagnosis, it takes a, a lot amount of time in order to secure that diagnosis, not secure, but, you know, to, for that diagnosis to be plain. Um, but, Again, um, something that Clark Atlanta did and is still doing, uh, there, there is every semester since the pandemic has started, we've had a mental health week. There's been some time taken away where we've gotten two or three days, Wednesday to the weekend to just you know relax or not have anything, not be responsible for any academic work. Um, like Charlie and probably most schools in, in Atlanta, we had access to the CARES Act um, I'm the SGA treasurer, graduate treasurer, so I saw that there was more than $3 million that was given away, uh, and I'm sure that was very helpful to students. Um, on the professional side, you know, uh, a lot of professors being in the social work department took themselves, uh, made themselves accountable and made themselves open to, you know, helping students with personal issues. Um, my school gave every student got a laptop in the mail. Um, because of course, going home, a lot of us did, may or may not have had access to, you know, technology like we did having access to the library. You know, just small things like that, or things that we think are small, um, have have definitely been impactful and, and helpful um, during this pandemic. Um, something else that was that I think is has been helpful and is helpful now. Um, while I while I was a student at Morehouse, there was an organization. Um, that was there called CHILL, and it's, the acronym is Counseling Humans and Life Lessons. Um, and it's a peer counseling group where, you know, students volunteer to help other students with mental health uh, coping strategies and skills. Um, and, you know, just taking those tips and tools and moving them forward, I definitely have definitely been helpful. Because, you know, again, we may or may not have access to pay $120 for a therapy session. We may not have access to, you know, or even know where to find a therapist or comfortable enough to have those conversations. But if if my friend 
that I know that, you know, used to live down the hall from me my sophomore year is a peer counselor. And I want to talk to somebody, anybody to tell them how I'm feeling today on this pandemic. I have access to that person. Yeah, all of those resources are so awesome. I mean, it's so great to hear that the universities are genuinely reaching out and and your organizations are genuinely reaching out and, and trying to improve the access to mental health. And now, obviously, for the three of you, mental health is important, but has the pandemic or any of the resources that you talked about urged you to place more importance on it? Or, or if you know anyone who didn't place importance on it before, like how has this affected um, the importance of mental health? I definitely think that I wouldn't say the narrative, but um, maybe some tendencies for professors regarding mental health has improved over the course of the pandemic. Um, like I said, when I went home in March, I still had midterms and finals um, and getting any sort of sympathy from the professors at some point were like pulling teeth. They were not understanding. Um, and it was very difficult, especially because moving back home as a college student and not having been home for the entire semester to then go back home where in some situations, home is not a safe place for people to be. Luckily, my, my home is, um, I, I love being home, but um, for some students, it was not the case. Um, and with some professors, it was very difficult to get any sort of accommodation. Um, and I think a lot of the students who weren't in a good living situation uh, were supported by those who like obviously cared about their mental health and we advocated on their behalf and, and eventually things got um, better in that specific situation. But I think even as the fall semester went through and now as we're ending the spring semester, um, it's very common for a professor to just extend a deadline two weeks or three weeks. If you, if you, like I've recently had some things come up that I needed to email my professor and be like, hey, I'm not coming in for a week or whatever. And they're very understanding about that. Um, so regarding your question about um, has any of our practices changed or anything like that? I'm hopeful that not just personal practices will change, but I'm hopeful that from an institutional standpoint, these changes that we've kind of experienced over the course of the last year regarding mental health and advocacy on behalf of students by professors and by the institution will continue. Um, and that in a non-COVID world in the next year, we're not going back to the same, um, you know, life that there wasn't advocacy. Um, I'm really hoping that, um, again, in the next six months or so, legitimate and permanent solutions we put in place for students um, on an institutional level. Uh, I will say something that uh, I personally was disappointed with in one of our administrators uh, is being on SGA, we have a lot of uh, candid conversations. And uh, one of the administrators said, there's been a lot of issues for uh, students and uh, them being penalized for not uh, showing up for attendance on with virtual services. And of course, as students, you know, that when we're all still in this transition as, you know, they made it, made it accessible for some students to come back on campus. Some students are still home. Some students are still, you know, trying to work. Some students, are battling with COVID. So, you know, having all of these varying complications um, for the student parents in particular, um, there was the, the administrator said something that was kind of insensitive regarding the, the student parents, you know, just saying that, you know, to me, he basically said that, you know, this is something that they signed up for and they knew what was going on. They knew they were a parent before they became a student. However, to me, it's like how, as a parent, as a current student, as someone who has privilege, you have a family, you have stability, you have a pension, you have a wife who can assist, you know, you, there is no way that you cannot have any sympathy or compassion for your students that you're supposed to represent when, you know, they're dealing with uh, having to work, having to take care of children. You know, um, so as one of the SGA representatives, we, me and some of my cohorts kind of came up with the idea to uh, have a student parent representative uh, on staff. So that way that those uh, individuals who do have concerns when it comes to um, being a parent and a student, 
you can voice those to your advocate and the advocate can be have a seat at the table for you in those rooms where they make decisions. Charlie, do you have anything you want to add to the question? I think that Atticus summed up a, a lot of what I've seen at Tech um, pretty well. And I think we are moving towards better understanding, especially because there has been a bridge and a gap between understanding that our mental health services are inherently racist. And there are so many students that we have not been able to support properly because our providers don't look like the students that they're serving. Um, and I think that is something that is slowly getting better. And it's part of tech's strategic plan to kind of pair that into more DEI work and making sure that we are checking that the demographics of our population are matching who we're actually providing for. And if we're not matching that up, why? And answering that question and figuring out how we can be better towards that. Um, so I think that's also one change of a perspective of what has shifted in importance for mental health and pairing that uh, systemic issue piece. Just one final note too, regarding schools responses. Um, obviously we're kind of coming, I wouldn't say to the end, but we're kind of coming to a point of you know, acceptance around the pandemic and, um, you know, working with it. I think as we've made great strides over the last year regarding um, adaptation to an online format, as we kind of start to shift out of that online format and classes start to come back in person, a lot of more of our events and meetings start to come back in person. Um, I'm not going to say that everything's going to get better. I think that we're going to have to pay very special attention and advocate just as much as we did at the beginning of the pandemic for mental health um, as we start to shift back into an in-person format because so much of our lives have changed um, and so much of everything we've done over the last year has been you know online we know how to study online we know how to take tests online we know how to have meetings online we know how to go to class online um, as we start to go back in person, for me especially, I have really bad test anxiety um, and I don't like going to classes but there's tons of people and the professors just blabbering on about whatever, you know. So being able to have something that I can go back and listen to recorded lecture has been super useful. So I think as we start to transition back to in-person formatting, we need to stay diligent about pushing for mental health um in that capacity because it can be just as traumatic or just as difficult for somebody to go back into a space that they might not feel comfortable in especially for first year students who were introduced to their college experience in an online format um, they're going to be shifted to an in-person format and in their second year their classes are going to be harder um, and i would argue that in person is much more difficult on a student than uh online is at least for me. So definitely continuing to advocate for mental health resources as we shift back in person. And you kind of already touched on the question, um, but we got a question in the chat. Um, do you think the schools could do more? And if so, what would you suggest? And you can go ahead and just jump on it since you were already on a roll, Atticus. <laughs> I definitely think, um, and Charlie, I think you and I are on the same board, but we're on the undergraduate Office of Undergraduate Education Advisory Board. Um, and we kind of talked about this with um, the provost and some other heads of the school, but pushing for uh, teachers to continue to have recorded lectures in some sort of format, even if it means posting past recorded lectures from this year for students to be able to go back and look at um, after the lecture time. Um, continuing for professors to really understand mental health is a huge priority, especially in um, undergraduate and some of the earlier classes as students transition from high school to college. Um, I definitely think there's a lot of things that universities can be doing. Um, specifically, I'm not quite sure exactly what. We're all kind of, you know, fumbling through this together. But um, personally, I would really appreciate it if classes are recorded and that advocacy from professors was continued um, through extensions or through understanding if you needed to skip a class or something. I also serve on the academic and campus culture committee for our partnership with JET. Uh, and that's the nonprofit that I mentioned earlier. 
And a big thing that we're looking at there is the actual trainings that professors have to go through, where they already get standard training for uh, just how to mitigate Canvas and how to deal with blue jeans and all of these other technical trainings. Uh, but they don't actually get much education in the way of actually supporting students through mental health crises or just any kind of mental health, really. Um, and so we are trying to make sure that they actually have required trainings that they have to attend and will benefit not only the students, but them. Uh, because we don't want to just say like, hey, these are the list of resources you have to give students and then call it a day. Um, because all of the resources, they're, they're posted in a lot of places. So it's really changing the demeanor that a professor has when opening up that class. Um, and so if we can get a professor to start feeling comfortable with mindfulness sessions, if we can get them comfortable about reaching out help from themselves for using their EAPs, for improving their own well-being, uh, then we hope that it'll trickle down and will create a, a better campus environment. And it it's not only there, but also the hiring process of asking if you have ever dealt with well-being issues before uh, as from former positions in higher education and, and really integrating it in a lot of different spaces, including addressing current events. Because I think that's one thing that has been happening a lot this semester and even this week with the Chauvin trial is that there were a lot of professors that maybe did not have an appropriate response to the stress that students were facing. Um, and there have been communications that have been sent out, but a lot of people feel not listened to. Um, and so better trainings around how to respond and support people when current events are, are really impacting and weighing on people as well. Go ahead, because I saw your hands right. I was just going to note that something that I really appreciated that one of our professors did in one of my classes was they would spend 10 minutes at the beginning of every lecture. This was a fluid mechanics class, so like very technical, like engineering stuff, but they would spend the first 10 minutes um, going over a famous artist. So like, this is my favorite painting in the background, girl with the pearl earring, but like they would go over like Klimt or Van Gogh or something like that, something completely unrelated to the topic, just to kind of like, you know, activate other parts of our brain before we got into like super technical stuff, which I really appreciated. Um, and I think that that's definitely something that should be maybe not explicitly talking about art pieces, but um, taking 10 minutes out of the beginning of a class to, um, you know, just check in with the student and say like, how are you doing? How is the homework going? It's simple, something as simple as that, or even like a professor talking about, you know, what they did that weekend or some of their passions that they might have or, something not related to the class, but just something to kind of like relate the professor to the student. Um, because I think a big issue within students um, and undergraduate or graduate, I'm not a grad student, so I can't speak to that, but I think just in uh, learning in general is they look at professors like, like these almighty beings and they're like, I cannot talk to you. I don't wanna ask you for an extension. I don't wanna ask you about my grade change. But in reality, the professor is working a nine to five. They go home to their kids. They go take them to soccer practice at the end of the day. Just as much as we go on walks with our friends when we get done with our classes, like they have a life just as much as we do. Um, so I think really breaking that barrier and kind of like bridging that gap between you're my professor, but I'm also like here for you, you know? Um, and I'm simply teaching you the lessons and I'm giving you what I'm required to do from a university system of Georgia standpoint in terms of quizzes or exams or homeworks or whatever. Um, I think that would be hugely transformational if they just took 10 minutes outside of the class to relate to the students and just make the students feel comfortable. Um, at least for the class that I mentioned before, I feel very connected with that professor. I would gladly talk to them if I saw them on the, you know, in campus, wherever, about whatever. Um, so I think that's one thing that uh, schools, or at least professors could start doing. Uh, to, to your point, I think uh, what I'm hearing is that, you know, professors, some professors could do better with humanizing themselves. Um, just trying to, you know, it doesn't have to be strictly business every day doesn't have to be, you know, where's your assignment? If you did it, you get the grade that you deserve. If you didn't, it, you get a zero. You know, just having some type of understanding and compassion to um, your students, your student body, 
um, and you know, for from the student to the professors, you know, you sometimes have to advocate for them. For me, I advocate for my professors all the time in my head, um, especially for some older professors who may have some technological difficulties. You know, when the semester first started virtually, um, there were some uh, professors who literally just gave us modules and said, "Y'all do that." We'll, I'll see y'all at the end of the semester. And as a student, you kind of feel like you're being slighted. I'm paying $640 a, a credit hour for this class. So I need some type of interaction. But, you know, I also had to understand, you know, that this person is definitely not techno, tech, technically savvy in order to, you know, engage with us on this level. So I think something that could help would be, you know, um, maybe some, during the summertime having the professors take a course where they're you know getting acclimated to the new technology and how it comes um there could be like like uh, Atticus mentioned you know giving making it a, making it a requirement to five to ten minutes in the beginning and end of each lecture where you know it's a lemon squeeze we can talk about how we're feeling if there's uh you know kind of make it an icebreaker you know what what song describes your mood right now you, you could uh, you know, what fruit do you feel like today? You know, it may sound silly, it may sound childish. However, it's, e it's easier for me to respect an individual who uh, looks at me as a human, respects my identity, and can at least tries to relate to me instead of making me feel like, you know, all of this, I already feel overwhelmed myself. I already put a lot of pressure on myself. Uh, you know, you have college students who are coming from far and wide to get an education. So the last thing we need right now is, you know, somebody else looking at us and making us feel inadequate. So definitely, again, just sharing that compassion on both sides and trying to understand where um, both parties or all three parties are coming from. I think also, um, just as much as we need to like humanize professors, we need to humanize each other as peers in our classes. Um, for me, at least in smaller classes where there's like 10 or 15 people, I do much better in those classes because I start to know everybody through the course of a semester. But if it's like a huge seminar class where there's like 100 plus people, I walk into that room and I feel c competition. You know, I'm like, I'm looking at everybody else. I'm like, the people in the first two rows are here to get that A. I'm sitting in the back row. That means I'm going to automatically fail, you know, and that should not be the case. Um, and it's not always the case, but for me, at least that's how I feel. So I think um, humanizing each other as students, you know, we just signed up for that section. We didn't know who else was going to be in that group, but they were there. Um, and so getting to know the other people in that class, if you have a group chat, you know, maybe introduce yourself. If you see some people that are sitting around you, say hello, you know, just be like, you know, why are you taking this class? If it's a required class, just say, what are you studying, you know? Um, like James was saying, we come from far and wide to get this education. We chose the school that we came to. We chose the major that we came to. We should get to know each other um, and you know, just connect and emote compassionately with each other. Um, it's gonna make the class go much better. And I know it's really difficult sometimes, but um, little tiny baby steps are just as big as the biggest step you can take, so. Uh, Charlie, do you want to speak to what you just put in the chat? I mean, that's a really good point. Uh, I think Destiny has a hand raise. Oh, um, you could have went first, Charlie. I was just going to address <laughs> something else. You go ahead. All right, sure. Um, another thing, and I think Addison, uh, excuse me, Atticus makes a really good point about making sure that you feel like you have friends in the class and having a grade score where you are actively promoting competition in your peers is not going to help them feel connected or feel like they're part of a community because it's inherently competitive. You are being compared to everyone in that class. And also there's no clear communication of what your grade is until the very end of the course. And so when you actually know what the cutoff is and you're not just trying to be better than the rest of the course, then one, it's a better experience for you because you are actually engaging in the material instead of just searching for a number. Um, and so other evidence-based practices like that, there, there are a lot of things that can be implemented 
um, at all levels. And I think one thing that tech suffers from, and I can't speak to other institutions, but we tend to silo our health and well-being uh, departments. And the providers do such a good job with actually meeting students and providing the services that they have, but we aren't fixing the upstream problem of why are so many people coming to our counseling center? And we are only just starting to ask that and address that. And that involves reaching across all departments, not just academic, but also housing, also um, student life and RSOs and all of these other facets of campus and just being a person, um, not just as a higher education student, but just as a person and filling all of those six aspects of well-being um, and supporting that. Destiny, what, what was it that you wanted to comment on? So actually, I'm glad that you had addressed that, Charlie, because I was going to make the connection to what Atticus said, um, having compassion in the classroom and also, you know, having the chance to connect with your peers. I feel like oftentimes college is set up for competition and oftentimes it's not healthy competition. And I know personally, it stems down to a point where I begin to compete with myself. And I know that may seem a little counterintuitive, but I know like deep down, I know that I could perform a certain way. And I know that what, I know that I'm comfortable with, you know, doing something in particular, but college make it so that you look at everyone around you so that you can one up what they are doing. And I don't think that's like really good for your mental health at all, because you're just at a consistent like race like on and on and on. And it's to a point where you're burning yourself out before you even get halfway to the finish line. So, yeah. Yeah, a amen. I mean, burnout is real. I always have like the first half of the semester, I'm on top of every single thing. And then towards the end of the semester, it just starts sliding and slowly I start falling off my work or forgetting something or accidentally writing the wrong deadline in my agenda. So, I mean, yes, it's the way it, the system is set up is just inherently making us think this way. So I think we have time for one more question. And this is kind of gonna be a little bit of a loaded question, but were there any positives that came out of the pandemic? And if so, what do you think they are? One positive I think that came out of the pandemic was that, you know, not one, there's definitely more than one. Um, people were given time to just be, people were given time to lay down on the couch and watch TV all day long. People had the opportunity to explore new ideas. People had the opportunity to, you know, spend quality time with their families. You know, again, as college students, we leave a year, we're gone nine months out of the year um, if we don't live close to our families. So you probably won't, you only get to see them for, you know, maybe three or four weeks at a time. But now, you know, I we I just got kicked out of school, mom. Hello, school over. You know, it's 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 <laughs> It's, it's good to, to, it was good, it was good for me to spend that time with my mom, spend that time with my friends that I grew up with, you know, back home, you know, trying to rekindle those relationships and, uh, you know, plane flights were, were cheap, you know, that was a benefit, gas was cheap, that was a benefit. Um, again, you know, if, if there was something that you wanted to work on, hone in on the skill, if you wanted to, you know, start your weight loss journey, you had time. To, to figure that out. So I think that was one of the benefits of it. I very much agree to your point. Um, it's kind of funny you mentioned scoot over mom, I'm coming home kind of thing. Cause um, when I first came, well, I guess when I first was planning on going back home, I did not want to go back home at all. I was like, again, avoiding dealing with the pandemic. So my idea of that was trying to stay on campus as long as I could, even to the point where I ended up like emailing the executive director of housing and was like, please do not make me go back home. And she approved it. Um, I didn't end up staying at campus because uh, I was like, I'm not going to stay here alone. I, it was, like I said, kind of like a fever dream situation. Um, and then when I went home, I started slowly loving being home, seeing my cat, um, 
watching TV shows with my mom. We got through like six different shows over the course of the summer. So it was great. Um, and I just texted her a couple of days ago. I was like, I miss being home and like watching, you know, TV shows because we'd always start at nine o'clock or something like that. Um, so I definitely agree that there's a lot of positives that have come out of the pandemic, despite so much tragedy and, you know, sadness going on. But it's very important to, from like a mental health standpoint, to, to kind of be grateful for what went well, um, recognize what might not have gone well, and then kind of look and see what you can make become positive in the future. I think a silver lining is that our toolkit for helping well-being issues was definitely expanded. And kind of what James touched on is that so many people were exploring their self-care in a way they never had before. And you had so many hobbies come up. Um, I'm a quarantine baker. I don't know about y'all, but I like to try so many recipes. I finally found my favorite banana bread after going through four different recipes. Um, and so that's really great. And it's not just what we can do ourselves and that self-care option, but also, like I said earlier, the options for telebehavioral health were expanded. And I think that's really exciting to see. I think that uh, we have a whole workforce that is more adaptable um, for treating mental health issues now because we have gone through this and it's been a challenge and I don't want us to be fully virtual forever. Um, but I think that we can go back and take some of the positive tools um, that did help increase access and did help to make people feel supported and keep running with that. Um, I think one thing, this isn't a silver lining, but just I do want to mention is that substance abuse disorders have gotten much worse throughout the pandemic. Um, and I think that there's a renewed wave for a drive to help that uh, policy making uh, area as well, because it did not get the same attention that mental health in general has. And that's another important disparity to really think about um, and keep close to our heart as we keep moving to not a new normal, but a new better. So we just had a question pop up in the chat. Um, what will you change concerning communicating with your fellow students once you go back to in-person lectures? Uh, I feel like I've always been uh, the a kind of guy that's been the connector, um, even in uh, virtual lectures you know I, being that I created relationships prior to the pandemic it was easier for me to maintain those relationships and it was also easier for me to you know reach out to the new student if I'm looking through the role or looking through the students on the gallery view and I see that there's a name that I don't know you know I can send him you know uh, a message in the group chat and just say hey bro um I know you're new this is blah 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 blah, blah. can I add you to this group me can I add you to you know, the, these type of networking relationships. So now, you know, he doesn't feel like that student that I'm new to this program. I don't know any of these people. I, I'm not in person where I, can, I can't create those relationships. You know, now it's easier for him to make those connections or her. Um, but I think that that has been one of my, uh, one of my strengths for a very long time. And the pandemic definitely enhanced those. I think too, um, as we start shifting back to in-person, we've all lived, you know, the last year together and everybody's not had the same experience, but the same general disconnect from everybody. So if you feel comfortable, definitely like reach out in the group chat, or if you can like send an email to the class and just be like, hey, it's been a long year. I hope everybody's doing okay. Would anybody want to get together to study or like go sit on the quad or something like that? Just like, I don't know, it's cheesy, but everybody kind of is like, I can't wait to go back to in person and see people and get to know folks. Um, and like I had mentioned, I mean, even up until I think what they would be considered now as the second years, they will have had a completely different um, undergraduate experience. Like the first years right now won't have had any in person lectures. And then second years currently, they transition to online in their second semester. So I would say a good chunk of the undergraduate population is probably very much yearning to find some, you know, in-person connections and friendships. So um, 
maybe if you feel comfortable, like I said, take that step and reach out to the class and just say, hey, I'm going to be on Tech Green. If you go to Tech specifically, that's like our quad area. Um, you know, at two, if anybody wants to come out and study or just like chat, we can. Or um, even if you don't feel comfortable reaching out to somebody and just saying like, hi, you know, like, what's up kind of thing, or I don't know, just reaching out, making a, a little step. Um, I don't know. I think personally, it's kind of scary, but if nobody else does it, it's not going to happen. So be the be the change, you know. I think my communications have become much more worldly. Um, I had a lot of friends that graduated and some of them are in Ireland, some of them are in like the Netherlands. And I am more focused on maintaining the relationships and the quality relationships that I had than I am in just connecting with everyone. I think my networking maybe has gone down uh, in my own experience, to be honest, but that is something I've made peace with. And I feel a lot more secure in the relationships I do keep. Um, and I think that is kind of different for everyone. Uh, I know a lot of, there, there was a New York Times article recently about how social dynamics have changed. Um, and young people are most likely to return to pre-pandemic uh, social groups of having lots of different pots of people that they kind of flit about. Um, but I don't think that everyone will necessarily have that. And it's kind of a comfort level about whether or not you want to have a broad social network again, or if you want to kind of keep it to your pandemic pod and acknowledging that there's no right answer there is also important. I couldn't agree with more with you guys. I mean, Excellent, excellent discussion. I enjoyed this so much. I mean, are there any final remarks that any either of you want to say? Uh, you, ultimately, you won't get everything right. Everything won't be done perfectly. Um, so again, the same way that we advocate for you to have compassion for your classmates and for your for, for your professors, definitely have that same grace for yourself. Um, don't be so hard on yourself if you i won't say miss a deadline but if you know if there's things that you wanted to accomplish today that you didn't get a chance to you know offer yourself some grace and you know just be kind to yourself and and, and remain disciplined um get your work done but uh you know be 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 as good to yourself as you would want somebody else to be good to you Yeah, all finger snaps here to that. Amen. Um, it was such a pleasure getting to talk to you guys and listen to you guys. I mean, amazing, amazing stuff. I think that Tiago is going to pull us out of our break rooms at 3.50. So thank you so much again, guys, for coming and watching. Thank you, Charlie, Atticus, and James for, for just creating such a lively and enriching discussion. It was such a pleasure.